so on. Okay, well, our approach to this problem has been to try to understand how the biological system works. And to do this, we take a structure-based approach and just to sort of very, I won't really be talking about many experiments here, but just sort of what we do. We're interested in understanding how the structure, um, uh, find, f establishing the structure of various biological systems, such as the one involved in nitrogen fixation. And our basic motivation is if you want to know how something works, you have to know what it looks like, you know, whether it's an airplane or a protein or a computer. And so um, we uh, use the technique of X-ray crystallography that was really, I think, sort of brought to its initial form by Linus Pauling at Caltech. Uh, the idea that um, you uh, have the system of interest that uh, you want to study and um, uh, just like what Kathy is doing here with the Center for Molecular Structures, we crystallize it mainly not only because they look beautiful, but it holds all these molecules in a defined orientation. We stick them in an X-ray beam, and the X-rays get scattered by the electrons in this object. We get these electron density maps that we have to interpret, and we finally get a structure. Uh, so this is all technical stuff that you know is actually pretty fascinating, but I won't be talking about. I should say really the important parts, more and more of the technical sides have become more streamlined. And in principle, you could solve the structure of anything. And so uh, uh, the real uh, challenge these days is to find systems to work on where the structure will tell you something about how it works. And so that's really is the analysis. What have you learned from the structure uh, that illuminates the system that you're studying? Uh, so there's a lot of time put into this part of the problem, and then these days uh, uh, there's a lot of time put into this part of the problem as well. So we're getting the sample, and most proteins that are interesting now that haven't been studied structurally, it's because they've been difficult to prepare the samples. Okay, so uh, we grow crystals, uh, again like uh, Kathy would, uh, we mainly uh, use the sort of same type of methodology you use to crystallize anything. Uh, where we essentially come up with, um, use this method of so-called vapor diffusion, where we have a drop that contains our protein. It's in a closed chamber over a reservoir that will have, say, a high salt uh, solution concentration, and so at least higher than in the drop, and so some water will evaporate from the drop to go into the reservoir to try to give you equal salt concentrations in the two conditions. And as water leaves the drop, it concentrates the protein. And if you set up things just right, you get crystals and not precipitation. So typically, at least by hand, these things are involved like microliters. But with robotics, you can get down to nanoliters and so on. And so uh, we'll be trying to purify proteins and then to put them in this sort of uh, apparatus so that we can eventually get crystals and try to solve their structure. Okay, well, uh, we're an institute of technology, and so we have a state-of-the-art crystallization robot. His name's Alan Lee, and uh, uh, actually I have to say in all, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, that Alan doesn't actually work on nitrogenase. So this, he's mainly working on the membrane protein side, but you can see him pipetting here with his pipetter, and all these trays here that are stacked up here are all the uh, crystallization setups these are 24 well trays, so each one of these wells is one crystallization uh, experiment and so on. And one of the occupational hazards of working in Southern California is that a lot of people don't have coats. And so you have to get a lab coat, so like a real coat, so they can work in the cold room. Okay, well to introduce, so that's sort of the background, to introduce the uh, uh, I guess the stars of uh, this talk are the enzymes that are responsible for nitrogen fixation. So these are uh, uh, catalyzed by the nitrogenase system. And nitrogenase consists of two component proteins that contain metals, and their names are really not so clever, I guess. There's one protein that has molybdenum and iron, and is known as the molybdenum iron protein, or MOFI protein. And then the other protein has iron, and it's known as the iron protein. Okay, so um, we'll look at these in more details, but just to sort of give you and describe in a bit more detail what these figures actually represent, because of course no protein actually looks like this if you had a powerful microscope. Um, 
Uh, these are proteins that contain uh, multiple subunits, and the metals are associated with them. In the MOFI protein, there'll be 30 irons, two molybdenums, and 32 sulfurs that are organized in different ways. Um, it turns out that this is the main sort of way of fixing nitrogen, but there are also uh, related systems that instead of using molybdenum, use vanadium or iron. And exactly how they work are still pretty, even more mysterious than, than uh, this. And then the iron protein, as they plays a role, it serves as a source of electrons. So reducing nitrogen to ammonia is a reduction. You need electrons. So the iron protein is the reductant, but it also requires ATP uh, hydrolysis as well. And so we've been interested in a lot of sort of ways in which ATP nucleotides are used by uh, this system. OK, well, there's a little, uh, like a little electron transfer chain or a set of wires where uh, th these proteins are in bacteria, but bacteria will have had something to eat, uh, which is reduced, just like our gasoline is, you know, hydrocarbons reduced food in the engine. It gets oxidized and release, uh, releases energy. And so in our metabolism, we take reduced food and oxidize it, combust it, but we save, store at least some of the energy. Uh, the electrons come in. Uh, through these set of proteins, first to the iron protein, then to the MOFI protein. Uh, that process is coupled to the hydrolysis of ATP. And eventually, these electrons get transferred to the nitrogen or other substrates uh, to give products. And our interest in uh, the system was really to try to understand the nature of the catalyst that allowed nitrogen fixation to take place under ambient physiological conditions which is in contrast to the Haber-Bosch process that requires very high temperatures and high pressures uh, to work, and also to try to understand what the role of the nucleotide is in this process. And I think um, we're getting a better idea of what the nucleotide's doing, which I won't really say much about. We still don't understand in any sort of great molecular detail how the metal centers, the active site, lowers activation barrier for dinitrogen reduction. But I'll spend more time on that in this talk. OK, and just um, actually some of the things you think that stoichiometry is you know, something boring that you learn in high school chemistry or college freshman chemistry. But uh, there are some outstanding stoichiometric issues that are still unresolved, not sort of how many electrons does it take to reduce nitrogen to ammonia, because that's six, but whether or not there's obligatory hydrogen evolution that takes place and how many ATPs are hydrolyzed per electron that's transferred. And in the standard model, when you reduce one nitrogen uh, to make two ammonias, you also make one hydrogen. So that's eight electrons. And the, uh, you take two ATP per electron, so that would be 16. And we like to think of these as very energy efficient systems, biological systems, they work at room temperature. But actually, when you put into, take into account how much ATP is required for this process, it actually is less efficient than the industrial Haber-Bosch process in terms of gigajoules per kilogram or whatever units are used of energy. OK, so uh, these proteins are oxygen sensitive. And so the main feature is that we recruit people that can hold their breath for a long period of time. Anyway, so we have to do everything attached to manifolds. So there is some turnover uh, since uh, Eric was in the lab, uh, but Jens and Kunyang are still there. Uh, the proteins, um, they have iron and sulfur, which generally have the sort of uh, brown or blackish uh, colors associated with them. These proteins are very acidic, which is useful in their purification because we can uh, use a column that has positively charged resin to bind to the proteins and then elute it off with um, uh, salt to weaken the electrostatic interactions. And the, you can see, actually, we've changed the prep now, so actually the background's much higher and you can't see the proteins. But this would be the MOFI protein, the iron protein, the flavodoxin, and the ferrodoxin uh, coming off. And this is just an elution profile. OK, well. Uh, as Kathy mentioned, uh, Eric was in the lab. So this was a picture from about four years ago. And um, um, uh, so Mika uh, and Eric have moved on to things. Uh, Jens looks a little younger, although he may not have uh, 
uh, may have let his beard grow, and Kun Young, I guess, looks happier. I'm not sure. Anyway, <laughs> okay. So my first graduate student at Caltech, John Sun Kim, uh, for his thesis, solved the structure of the molybdenum iron protein. And so, just to sort of uh, introduce uh, this. Uh, the MOFI protein is, has four subunits, so it's a tetramer, two copies of the alpha subunit, which you can't really distinguish from the other subunit, the beta subunit, but the alpha subunit, one's here, one's here, and then the beta subunits, one's here, and one's here. Associated, so in a sense, we think of this as being composed of two pair alpha-beta subunit pairs, and associated with uh, each alpha and beta pair are two types of metal centers that we'll mainly be focusing on. One is the iron molybdenum cofactor, which is where nitrogen binds and gets reduced, almost certainly. And the other is the P-cluster, a little harder to see, to the interface between these two subunits. Now this is a type of representation, again, it's a, obviously an artistic uh, depiction, uh, that's trying to convey some information about how the the polypeptide chain that connects all the amino acids is organized in space. And uh, there are different types of ways in which the polypeptide chain can fold. There are some that are these sort of spirals, which are known as alpha helices, these uh, that are in light blue. In red, we have these sort of like arrows, which form strands that form a sheet. Those are known as beta sheets. And Linus Pauling, uh, uh, really recognize before any protein structures were solved that the alpha helix and beta sheets would be important elements of protein structure. And everything that's not a sheet or a helix is this green sort of color here. Okay, well there are a lot of different ways you can represent uh, proteins, and so another way is with a ball and stick model, and so this is a ball and stick model of the MOFI protein, which is harder to sort of appreciate. Uh, one of the things that's fascinating about proteins is to take some liberties, but you just add water and they're spontaneously able to fold up into a specific three-dimensional structure. And, you know, if your experience is like mine in terms of trying to pack things into boxes or suitcases, it's very difficult for them just to efficiently pack together in a way that the polypeptide chains of proteins are able to. And so, uh, anyway, buried within this, it's hard to see, but the business end of this molecule is right here. So this is the iron molybdenum cofactor. So you have all these part of the protein here, uh, and uh, yet this little part here with the metal centers, what's involved with this tiny substrate, N2, uh, gets uh, reduced. Okay, anyway, so another thing I wanna, one time I made a mistake of timing my talk and I recorded it, and ever since then, at times when I don't expect it, that seems to take over. And so that's what's happening right now, so I apologize. Uh, this was actually for, um, we built this beam line uh, with, through a donation, speaking of how important uh, philanthropists are, uh, that uh, uh, Gordon Moore and uh, his wife gave a lot of money. Gordon Moore got his PhD in chemistry at Caltech. He then founded Intel, made a lot of money, gave us a lot. We built a beam line at Stanford, and so we were dedicating the beam line. And so Moore was there and all these other people, and I was giving my talk, and of course when you're giving the talk in your head, you go a lot faster than when you're in front of people. And so this exactly same thing was happening, where the talk slides kept running away, and so Gordon Moore was there, so. Uh, 